I'm not the type of person who believes in ghost stories, folklore, or tall tales. I've been a park ranger for over 15 years, and in that time, I've heard it all. Campfire stories about creatures in the woods, whispered warnings about haunted trails. Most of the time, these tales come from overactive imaginations, nothing more. But what happened during the summer of 2012 at White Oak National Park has stayed with me, and no matter how much I try to convince myself it wasn't real, the memory still haunts me. I had been stationed at White Oak for nearly two years when it happened. White Oak was one of those remote, sprawling parks deep in the Appalachian Mountains. It was a beautiful, rugged place, filled with dense forests, rocky cliffs, and hidden valleys. Despite its beauty, though, there was an eerie stillness about it. The kind that makes you feel like you're being watched, even when you know you're alone. The summer had been a busy one, filled with hikers, campers, and families exploring the park. But by mid-August, things had started to slow down. Most people were returning to their normal lives, and the park became quieter, more desolate. That's when I got the call. It was a Friday evening, just after sunset. I was in the ranger station, going over some routine paperwork when the radio crackled to life. It was one of the volunteer rangers, a kid named Danny who had just started working for the summer. Hey Jack, you there? His voice sounded nervous. I picked up the radio. Yeah Danny, what's up? I'm out on the North Ridge Trail, about two miles in, near the old fire tower. There's something weird here. Weird how? It's hard to explain. You'd better just come check it out. Danny wasn't the type to scare easily so his tone caught my attention. I grabbed my flashlight and hopped in the truck. The North Ridge Trail was one of the less popular ones, a narrow, overgrown path that wound its way up into the hills. Not many people used it, especially after dark. As I drove, the sun dipped below the horizon and the park was plunged into darkness. The only light came from the beams of my headlights as they cut through the thick forest. I made it to the trailhead and parked. Danny was waiting for me at the entrance, his flashlight flickering in the distance. What's going on? I asked as I approached him. He gestured toward the trail, his face pale. You've got to see this, Jack. We started down the path, the thick canopy of trees overhead blocking out what little moonlight there was. The air felt heavy, almost oppressive, as if the forest itself was holding its breath. After about ten minutes of walking, Danny stopped and pointed ahead with his flashlight. There. At first, I didn't see it. But then, as I focused, I realized what he was pointing at. A small clearing lay just off the trail, and in the center of the clearing stood something that made my blood run cold. It was a pile of rocks, carefully stacked into a pyramid shape, almost like a makeshift cairn. But what disturbed me wasn't the rocks themselves. It was what was hanging from them. Dangling from the top of the pile were several small, crudely carved wooden figures, they looked like stick people, with twisted limbs and hollow eyes. They swayed gently in the breeze, creaking as they moved. What the hell is this? I muttered, stepping closer. I don't know, Danny said, his voice shaking. I found it about an hour ago. Thought maybe it was some kind of prank, but... I reached out and touched one of the figures. It felt rough, splintered. Whoever had made these had put a lot of effort into them, and the craftsmanship was unsettlingly precise. Weird, but probably harmless, I said, trying to sound more confident than I felt. Kids messing around, most likely. Danny nodded, but he didn't look convinced. I decided to make a note of it and keep an eye on the area. We turned back toward the trail, but as we started to walk away, I heard it. A soft rustling sound like someone, or something, moving through the brush behind us. I spun around, shining my flashlight into the trees, but there was nothing there. The forest was still. You heard that, right? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. Danny nodded, his eyes wide. Yeah, we're not alone out here. We stood there for what felt like an eternity listening. The air was thick with tension, the kind that makes every muscle in your body tighten. But eventually, the sound stopped and the forest returned to its eerie silence. Let's get out of here, I said, my voice tight. We hurried back to the truck, and as we drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. The next day, I reported the strange find to my supervisor, Carl. He was an old-timer, someone who'd been working in the park for decades and had seen just about everything. Probably just kids, he said with a shrug, not looking too concerned. We get weird stuff like that sometimes. People like to play pranks, especially in these old woods. But something about it didn't sit right with me. 
The precision of the carvings, the way the rocks had been stacked. It felt too deliberate, too ritualistic. Over the next few days, things only got stranger. Hikers began reporting odd occurrences. People claimed to hear whispering voices in the woods, voices that seemed to call their names. Others said they saw figures moving between the trees, shadowy shapes that disappeared as soon as they looked directly at them. And then there were the disappearances. The first was a young couple, campers who had been staying in one of the remote sites near the North Ridge Trail. They had set off on a hike one morning and never returned. Search teams combed the area, but there was no sign of them. No tracks, no gear, nothing. It was as if they had vanished into thin air. A few days later, another hiker went missing. This time it was a man in his 50s, an experienced outdoorsman who knew the park well. He had been hiking alone, and like the others, he simply disappeared without a trace. By this point, everyone in the park was on edge. Something was happening in White Oak, something no one could explain. One evening, about a week after the couple went missing, I decided to head out to the North Ridge Trail again. I don't know what possessed me to go back. Maybe it was curiosity, maybe it was the need to find answers. But I had to see if the strange pile of rocks was still there. As I made my way through the forest, the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the ground. The deeper I went, the more I felt that oppressive presence again, like the woods themselves were watching me. When I reached the clearing, the pile of rocks was still there, but it had changed. There were more figures now. Dozens of them, hanging from the rocks like macabre decorations. They were all different, each one twisted in its own unique, grotesque way. And then I saw it. Something glinting in the dirt at the base of the pile. I bent down and picked it up. It was a bracelet, one of those cheap woven ones you can buy at tourist shops. I recognized it immediately. It belonged to the missing woman from the young couple. I'd seen her wearing it when she checked into the park office. My heart raced as I looked around, my flashlight beam sweeping across the trees. I felt like I was being watched, like something was just beyond the edge of the clearing, hidden in the shadows. Suddenly, I heard it again. That rustling sound, only this time, it was louder. Closer. I backed away slowly, my hand on the radio at my hip, ready to call for help. But before I could say anything, the whispering started. It was faint at first, barely audible, but it grew louder, more distinct. It was a woman's voice, soft and breathy, calling my name. Jack. I froze, my blood turning to ice. I knew that voice. It was the missing woman. The one who had disappeared without a trace. Jack, help me. I spun around, my flashlight frantically searching the darkness, but there was nothing there. Just trees and shadows. And then I saw them. Eyes. Dozens of them, glowing faintly in the darkness, staring at me from the trees. They were everywhere, surrounding me, watching, waiting. I ran. I don't remember how I made it back to the truck, but I did. I peeled out of there, the tires kicking up dirt and gravel as I sped down the road, my heart pounding in my chest. I reported what I found to Carl the next day, but when we went back to the clearing, the pile of rocks was gone. The figures, the bracelet, everything had disappeared. The disappearances were never solved. The young couple, the hiker, they were never found, and the whispering voices, the eyes in the trees. I never told anyone about those. Who would believe me? But every time I close my eyes, I can still see them. Watching. Waiting. I don't work at White Oak anymore. After that summer, I requested a transfer to another park, far away from those cursed woods. But no matter how far I go, the memory of that place follows me. And I know deep down that something is still out there. I'm a park ranger or guide in Greater Kruger area. A while ago, I was guiding student groups on a farm in Bowell Reserve. We stayed in an old farmhouse. Some rooms were turned into dorm rooms. One day, a staff member went to fetch some sand from a dry riverbed nearby he needed to make some cement. He came back saying he saw tracks of an animal that he'd never seen. He had some of his colleagues have a look. They all said the same thing. So by now I'm intrigued and I go down to the riverbed to have a look. Sure enough, there they are, like a buffalo, but not exactly the round shape you'd expect. Seemed like two pairs of buffalo tracks. Then I saw it, that's not two pairs, it's four pairs, of an animal walking upright, goosebumps all over, hair on my neck standing straight up. I called the warden, he came with his new sniffer dog. That dog went to work, 
but it was obvious those strange animals knew we were on them. Out the reserve, over the railway line, back in the reserve, then again onto another farm, all the way to the horse stables at the edge of Hodesprout Town. That s where we caught the last one, hiding in the stables. But there were four in total. The one we got first broke a leg when jumping over the fence of the reserve. Two others tried to hide under the railway line. Later we also found the rifle, which they had thrown away while running. A .308 with a silencer. We also found bullets in a panga. Now we could charge them with something else than trespassing. They didn't make a victim that time. But they are successful regularly. All our anti-poaching efforts are like mopping with a running tap. I think our rhino are on the way out. We try to fight the symptoms, but cannot fight the cause. And no one seems to care on the whole planet. For just a few species, lion, rhino, elephant, pangolin, no one puts political pressure on any country in the Far East. Possible cryptid type creature, my friend, and I saw on a drive tonight. Cryptids. So, me and my friend Kaz decided to go on a drive about an hour ago because there was a spot I'd been looking at going to at night because it was secluded and a good spot to smoke in general. Around when we started talking about it, he noted that he started smelling something sweet, cherries, and a hint of cigar. I was familiar with this entity as it's been around my room since I moved in back in 2020. It's not a benevolent entity and is actually quite kind. Kaz stated that it felt like he'd been hugged and just overall felt comfort with the entity around. So we go on the drive and we're talking and all, and we turned down the last road until the destination when I saw a tree down in the road. It didn't block the road completely, but it was too narrow of a gap for my car to fit. Well, I knew a back road that led to the same destination, so we turned around and headed down that way. It was a very wooded back road. No service, very few houses for miles and surrounded by trees. It was the type of road to only have one lane because of how unused it is. As I'm driving, we're talking and we pass over a bridge. I pointed out as a spot I wanted to take him another time since it's just a neat area. Not long after we passed it, he said, did you see that? It's a very curvy road, so I initially assumed it was an animal as I hadn't seen anything. I asked what he saw and he said, it looked like something that crossed the road. Immediately, I got an intense feeling of dread. I asked if he felt it too and he confirmed that he did so I stopped the car took a moment and immediately said, we're not supposed to be here. He agreed and I turned around, heading back to where we just came. The dread got more intense, but after we crossed the bridge it eased, but was still there. I stated that whatever it was isn't allowed to follow us home, and it wasn't allowed on my property. It started to disappear and we kept seeing things along the road like shadows. As I was driving to the main road, a white truck pulled up very fast to a stop sign on a side road, almost as if out of thin air and pulled out behind us. I didn't take much note of it until I looked in my rear view and saw it tailing the hell out of us. I pointed it out and Kaz said he didn't like the feeling he got from the truck. We got to the stop sign that lead out to the main road and I purposefully didn't turn my blinker on in case it was following us, but the truck did and it was turning the same way as us. After I made the turn, I waited a few moments before looking back in the rear view, and it was gone. It disappeared into thin air. The drive home was silent, and Kaz waited until we got back to talk about things he knew and should have thought of before we even got in the car. I was telling the story to a friend over Discord and asked Kaz to describe the thing he saw on the road, asking if it walked on two legs or four. He said, it didn't have legs. It was brown and looked like a head that just crossed the road. Asking him about it now, he said that it was tall, taller than the doorframe of my closet, and he saw it from a distance, so he didn't know what its body looked like. I asked if it could have been a bat, and he emphasized that it couldn't have been. During the drive home, we both noted that it felt like there was a hand on each of our shoulders. He pointed out the log in the road could have been a sign not to go, as well as the friendly entity that appeared in my room beforehand. I'm thinking it's a certain W-word entity names hold power, and I will not refer to it by name. I had seen things as a kid off and on, but I didn't remember any of it. Always stories from my mom or aunt or grandma about some creepy shit. I said to them, usually these incidents had allegedly happened at one particular aunt's house, Aunt Sandy's. Around 17-year-old, I remember thinking about how they all used to tell me these stories and thinking to myself, 
I think I lost it, the ability to see ghosts. Then days later something happened that made me realize that it never really goes away. My aunt's house that I would see stuff at as a child was built in the 1800s western New York area. My cousin who grew up in that house and I are very close and in age we are two years apart. She was 15 year old at the time and we are the only two females out of the kids so we are like sisters. I remember vividly we were in her bed. She was telling me about the boys she liked and I was listening. Her bedroom door was shut and her lights were on and we were sitting there going about our business. While she was talking her voice got fainter. I could still hear her rambling on but it was muffled. I looked over at the bedroom door to my left in the direction my cousin was sitting and her shut door appeared open to me. Standing in the doorway was a hooded figure. I looked at it for a bit, realized that the door should be shut and not open. Shook my head literally like how they do in the movies because I was so confused by what was happening. Immediately the visual scene returned to normal and the door appeared shut as I knew it to be. My cousin still rambling notices me shake my head and trying to get my barrings back and asked what was wrong. I said, weird. I think I just saw a ghost. We are weird and were not scared and thought it was cool lol. Fast forward a few weeks we are at my other aunt's house Aunt Renee visiting my grandparents who were staying there while they were in town from FL. My cousin and I were in a room by ourselves and talking when we could hear out in the kitchen my aunt Sandy cousin's mom with the haunted house telling a ghost story. Because her ghost stories were always the best she also didn't get scared by things we got all excited I said, ooh oh sounds like ghost story time and we ran out to the kitchen. As soon as I came into view I said, Aunt Sandy, are you telling ghost stories? And she looked at me and said, yeah, it's a new one oh, you have seen him too. Like she knew this just by looking at me. I said, yes, the last time I was at your house. She said, what did you see? I told her I thought it was a monk and that he didn't scare me, he just looked at me and that was it. She said, he is a monk. Our house used to have a few of them who lived there at one point. He's a nice ghost. He checks on us all throughout the night. He walks up and down the hallway. He came into my room the other night. I thought it was Uncle Hank so when Uncle Hank finally got into bed, I yelled at him for coming in and out of the room all night and asked him what in the hell he was looking for on the dresser. He thought I was nuts and said that was the first he had been up all night. So that sold me on the whole ghost thing. But here is how I can be a little less sad when I lose someone in the physical world. Subsequent to the above ghost story, a lifetime has passed. My aunt is gone now and when she passed I had been through a tough divorce with an abusive man and was always fighting over custody of my kids to keep them safe. Aunt Sandy left this world prematurely, but on her deathbed she said to me, I am her goddaughter, I have a list. My cousin and I asked what she meant. She said, I have a list of the people that I am going to haunt when I die. Mariah, my grandpa's current wife, is on it, and so is your exusband. I laughed because I thought it was cute that on her deathbed she loved me so much she was plotting revenge on my behalf against my ex in the afterworld. It was funny until it happened. Then it was awesome. She passed away May 1st. August 17th, after a very dramatic and stressful week of my ex-husband trying to run away or kidnap with our kids, he just brought them to me. He told me he was giving me full custody and I wouldn't have any trouble from him going forward, he just wanted peace. I was very confused, these comments were extremely off the wall, he sounded like he had gone completely crazy. He told me how he thought his neighbor had been trying to break into his house, and that he even thought he had a secret way into his side of the duplex. He stated that he had cameras around and proceeded to show me footage of our dog greeting someone at the garage door area, but it was slightly off and you didn't have a full view of the door so you couldn't see if anyone was actually there. But her body language suggested she was greeting someone by the way this is not a friendly dog to strangers so not convinced she'd let a non-family member into the house. My aunt though, she was like the dog whisperer. Animals in general loved her even the wild ones. This apparently had been going on for a few months and was intensifying hearing things, the dog acting like it was engaged with someone who wasn't on camera. Despite his 12 video cameras around the house he kept hearing things but he never could find anyone in the house when he would look. At this point of sleep depravity, he really started to unravel and eventually, he decided that the kids needed to be with me where they were safe since his neighbor was after him for no apparent reason. I honestly think my aunt haunted this guy until he gave me full custody of my kids. I know she did. His neighbors were an elderly brother and sister who shared the other half of the duplex. 
Neither of them were able-bodied enough to perform anything exceptional, let alone do it discreetly. He surrendered the children to me, and they are both grown now and are happy and healthy. So the story when I was 17 let me know that ghosts are real. And the story from adulthood let me know that even if our bodies are gone, our energy is still so here. If you read this, thanks. In my case, it was more of what didn't happen that convinced me. We were half convinced already, but one Halloween after we moved into a new area, we decided to go ghost hunting. I know, tried as all hell and as stereotypical as one could possibly be. So we did the first cemetery and was spooked out and got plenty of odd photos. We did the second cemetery and was freaked out even more. We went to the third on in town, which is actually well documented as being haunted and were super freaked out. Got a lot of odd things happening. EVP, strange shadows, stranger photos. We went to the fourth and final cemetery in town. By now, one could argue that this was all self-fulfilling prophecy kind of stuff. We did this on the stereotypical night of the year for this sort of thing. We did it at the right time of the night for maximum haunting. We were freaked at the first one, and naturally the freak out we had at that one reinforced the feelings we had as we got to the second, and the second reinforced the third. So with that, we were approaching the fourth and final one in the town. We were spooked to all hell. We approached the threshold, reinforced by three creepy as f incursions into the other cemeteries, nervous as hell, clutching each other's hands and stepped into the cemetery and felt nothing. Might as well have been walking into a park. We should have been scared off out tits from the previous three, but we felt nothing. Later research indicated that cemetery was not haunted at all. Two new and most of the tombstones indicated lifespans of at least 65 plus years, so little to no tragedy. So to our minds, we realized that there had to be something to it, all since we felt something in the three that were active haunting sites and didn't feel anything in the quiet one that helped us believe that there was something going on. I've had a number of experiences. After my dad died, I was at work and was alone in a conference room reading material and typing. I had one of those flexible U-shaped earbud headsets around my neck. The end on each side rested about 1.5 inches below my collarbone. I was typing and felt something moving on my left side from my chest to the back of my shoulder. I patted my upper chest on the left and didn't feel the headset. The left side of it was over my shoulder. I moved it back and tried to figure out how it could have moved. I started typing again. A couple of minutes later, it happened again. There is no way that anything I was doing could cause that to happen. It takes deliberate action to move them. My dad was a prankster, so maybe he did it. Another series of events involves an antique lawyer's bookcase that I bought. I brought each of the five pieces into the house, dusted and assembled it, and put some small antiques in it. As soon as I left the room it was in, a cross necklace that I had worn for years and never had issues with fell off my neck onto the floor. I checked the clasp and it was fine. Shortly after getting it, I got a consulting gig in Arkansas for six months. While there, I bought some other small antiques and 1960s civil rights documents. When I got home, I dusted the cabinet and put in the new antiques. That night, the chain on my cross necklace broke. I replaced the chain and nothing happened until I interacted with it again to dust it. When I was done, I couldn't locate my phone. I looked everywhere, tried calling it from my landline and used the Find My Phone app on my computer. Nothing. After an hour of looking, I finally stood in the center of the family room or kitchen area and said, please give me back my phone. At that exact moment, my phone pinged. It was in the laundry room under a bunch of clothes in the hamper. I only had gone into the laundry room to get a rag and furniture polish and I live alone. The third is after I bought an antique pre-Hoosier possum cabinet. The night after it was delivered, I had fallen asleep on the couch. I woke up to a man in Dust Bowl era clothes standing in my living room. I screamed and he dissolved. A couple nights later, I woke to another man standing by my bedroom door. I screamed and he retreated into the wall. Over the next few weeks, I woke up to an old lady on my bed, an old lady and little girl standing beside my bed, and another couple apparitions. I bought holy water and a cross and put them on the hutch. The activity stopped until I moved. I saw people in my room a couple more times while I still had the cabinet. My son's golden retriever, Rosie, was staying with me one of those times. 
I woke to see a man standing by the door, sat up and screamed. Something was on top of me. It was Rosie, who was standing straddled over my body and was staring right where the apparition was. Night terrors, maybe, but I've never been paralyzed and it doesn't explain Rosie. My brother has the cabinet now. His wife refuses to let him remove the cross and holy water. I only periodically wake to heads looking at me or hands reaching for me now. I usually am able to tell myself that they won't hurt me and I wait for them to dissolve before going back to sleep. Any thoughts about these events? I'd sure love some insight. In recent years, John Ramirez, who worked for the CIA for 25 years, emerged as a voice on UAPs and shared his insights on the subject that he learned during his career. He states that the exploration of consciousness and its connection to the unidentified aerial phenomena issue can significantly shape our understanding of the phenomena and their implications on humanity. During an interview, Ramirez stated that non-human intelligence has been around us for a long time. He referred to the Roswell incident and mentioned that there were accounts of telepathic communication with survivors of the crash. He also stated that the CIA had separate divisions focusing on the aerospace and aerodynamic qualities of UFOs and the biological connections with the non-human occupants. These interests by the CIA led directly to the development and use of remote viewing within the department. He further discussed his beliefs regarding alien forces and their influence on humanity throughout history. Ramirez suggests that ancient myths and legends are a part of lost human history. He believes that the ancient accounts document instances of contact with non-human intelligence, which he believes are divine beings. If you look at the Sumerian texts, they knew a lot more about the world than we give them credit for because we look at history so linearly. You know, we think that we are the pinnacle of knowledge and that before us, they didn't have the knowledge we have now. But what I think happened was that they did have the knowledge. However, that knowledge was lost or suppressed by other humans with agendas. And now we are rediscovering that knowledge through science. But through that science, we are going to rediscover our connection to the divine and these non-human intelligence who have been here and want to help us not destroy ourselves. During his time at the CIA, Ramirez began experiencing frequent contact and communication with beings that he could not see the faces of, but who appeared shrouded in a cloak. Ramirez later discussed the topic of reptilians and their alleged involvement in society and governmental structures. Ramirez clarifies that when referring to reptilians, he does not mean actual lizards, but rather individuals with reptilian ancestry who may appear human. He stated that humans may have had advancements and influences from other beings, including reptilians. It's interesting though when I look at some of the official logos launched by the NRO, which is the actual secret space program of the US intelligence community, they launch secret spacecraft into orbit, and I can say that much, but they use these lizards as part of the logos and I find that very strange. And they're lizards that are crawling all over the Earth. For the past eight years, I've served as the commanding officer of a Special Operations Navy SEAL Task Force, and as of today, I've officially handed over my position. Now, obviously, I'm not going to tell you which Navy SEAL Task Force this is, nor am I at liberty to discuss what we do or what we have done. But what I am going to tell you are the rules we are expected to follow. I guess writing this serves as a form of catharsis for me now that I'm no longer in command. To Major Patrick, not his real name, but I assume the person in question will know I'm addressing him when he reads the rules. If you're reading this, know that I have great confidence in your ability to lead, but I cannot emphasize this enough. Follow the rules, even if they sound like superstitious nonsense. You see, when I took over command eight years ago, I probably had the same thoughts you're having now. I still remember the day I took over as though it were yesterday. Good morning, sir. Good morning, corporal. At ease. At my words, the young corporal hastily cut down his salute and flashed me a beaming smile. I took a glance at his name tag and asked, Corporal Emerson, where would I find the office of Lieutenant Colonel Tom? His smile grew even wider. It was frankly alien to me how one could be so happy in the mornings, particularly a cold and dreary morning like this one. Who the hell smiles so much at a superior officer? Either he's a complete kiss ass or there's something seriously wrong with this guy. It's right this way, sir, down this road, third building to the right. Is his smile getting wider? What exactly did I say to make him so happy? 
Feeling my hair stand on end from his increasingly creepy smile, I dismissed him with a wave and drove off in the direction he pointed me in. Hopefully he wasn't smiling because he was playing a prank on the new guy. Sure enough, his directions were accurate, and I soon found myself sitting in the office of one Major Tom, the person I was here to take over. Imagine those special force operators you see in movies totally not accurate by the way, then crank that image of Batisseri all the way up to 11, and then crank it up some more. Throw in a full sleeve tattoo of a dragon that extends all the way up to and wraps around the neck, thick bulging veins on the forehead and hazel eyes that look like they're seeing all your past sins and judging you for them. That is what Major Tom looks like. He was a beast of a man is what I'm saying. Someone who would mess you up if you so much as looked at him the wrong way. Someone who looks like he wakes his alarm clock up in the mornings. And to top it off, his voice was thunderously gruff. It made every word out of his mouth seem like he was engaging you in a shouting match. Good thing he's a man of few words. Major Rick, good seeing ya. Like the view from your new office. It's all right, sir. It's an honor for me to. Cut the bullshit, Rick. Nobody wants to command this shithole, and you know it. Right, sir. This shithole, as you put it, happens to be the single most well-equipped task force this side of the world. It really is an honor. Well, maybe this'll change your mind, Freshy. I took the piece of crumpled paper he handed me. Funny, I would have figured this guy for someone who would demand for his paper to be ironed and wrinkle-free like his shirts. Opening the note revealed a list of hand-scribbled rules in different handwritings. Seems like it's a note passed down through generations of COS. Well, don't just gawk at it, read it, or are you a dumbass who can't even read? The note was simply titled Rules. Lights out for everyone at 2359 hours daily whilst in base. Between lights out and reve, if you hear the sound of a bouncing ball, ignore it. Keep your eyes closed and pretend to be asleep. Frequency 44750 is not to be used for any training exercises or operations. Barracks number five in Echo Koi is the only bunk with three doors. The middle door must not be closed. No training to be conducted in base on Thursday nights. Any night training that takes place on Thursdays must be conducted outside of base. The Kim's range only has 17 targets. There is no target Zulu. Do not engage target Zulu. If an old woman approaches you wherever you are and offers to sell you food, buy whatever it is she offers, but never eat the food. Do not accept any change from her. And for the love of God, do not reject her. If you ever hear a soft giggling behind you, do not turn around. Do not acknowledge it. Never use the shower after 2359. See rule number one. She does not appreciate anyone knowing about her. Regardless of your religion, go to the altar on the roof once a week at three and bow in silence for one minute. This is the only exception to rule number one. If the children approach you and ask for your help, help them in whatever way you can. They may deign to reward you. If you are approached by someone named Emerson, do not speak to him. There is no Emerson within our base. She knows. I rolled my eyes at the list of superstitious nonsense. This was probably a hazing process for new COS, set up so that the staff officers and play a prank on them. Probably some sick initiation tradition that I'd have to scrap in my tour. However, Rule 13 made me slightly uneasy. Did they set it up so that the first person I met would be the corporal? No wonder he was all smiles. Sir, how'd you know the first person I met would be Corporal Emerson? Was the prank planned that far in advance? Tom looked at me, patted me on the back and sighed. Son, if you already broke the rules on your first day, how the hell are you going to survive the rest of your tour? Sir, I've been part of hazings in my day. Hell, I've even conducted some of them, but this is by far the most elaborate form of hazing I've ever seen. Well done, sir. I'm in awe. Shaking his beefy head, Tom sighed. Look freshy. We ain't hazing ya. You need to listen very carefully. Do not F up the other rules. Emerson's a major pain in the ass, but he ain't the worst thing that'll happen to ya. Sir, I mean no disrespect, but you can't possibly expect me to believe that this. This list of superstitious bullshit is true. Fed up, Tom reached behind him, pulled out a thick file and tossed it in my direction. This here is the battalion nominal roll. All of our guys' files are in there. Take a look and tell me if you see an Emerson. Fortunately, the nominal role was meticulously sorted in accordance to rank. As I flipped through the list of corporals, there was no Emerson to be found. This can't be possible. 
Maybe he was wearing someone else's uniform. Yet, as I flipped through the pages, none of the photos even remotely resembled that creepy smiling man I met at the gate this morning. That's impossible. I know you got questions, Freshie, but I ain't got the time nor the crayons to answer ya. The governor's coming in 15 mics and I gotta go get his entourage ready. Roman 2. Patty, get in here and brief our Freshie while I go get the ladies presentable for the governor. At his command, the door slid open, and in came the prettiest woman I'd ever seen. Well, this side of the wire anyway. Shoulder-length platinum blonde hair, tied neatly into a ponytail, clear blue eyes as dazzling as the brightest sapphires. I'm not ashamed to admit, I was instantly smitten. Captain Patty Jenkins at your service, sir. I'm serving as the executive assistant to the commanding officer of the force. I understand as of today that it'd be you, sir. She flashed a dazzling smile and stuck out her hand. Close that mouth of yours, Major, before you swallow a fly. I know Patty here's a sight for sore eyes, but don't you be getting any ideas now. Captain Patty's a distinguished honor graduate from the 72nd Ranger course. She ain't just a pretty face. Major Rick Thompson. I'm heir. I'm the commanding officer as of today. Pleasure to meet you. I shook her hand. Her hand surprisingly clammy. Patty, get the Major up to date on the SOPs of this place and brief him about the rules. Gotcha, sir. As I laid in bed that night, I furrowed my brows as I recalled Patty's reaction when she was explaining things to me. Well, that's it, sir. That's the whole list now. So you don't need to worry about Emerson, all right. Sometimes I suspect he's just lonely. He's always looking for someone to talk to, sir. Sir, is everything okay? How can anything be okay? Based on everything I'd heard, something was seriously wrong with this place. Mass hallucinations. I couldn't find any sort of logical explanations for any of the things she had mentioned. Patty, I think you forgot about rule number 10. Her lips formed a thin line and her eyes narrowed. Then quietly and almost imperceptibly, she shook her head. Forcing a smile, she said, Well then, I'd best go back to my work now, sir. Let me know if you need anything else. That was weird. I guess I'll ask the guys at PT in the morning. My phone buzzed. Hello, sir. PT is at 5. It'll be a three-mile coastal run conducted by Staff Sergeant Michaels. Good night. I left her on read and glanced at the time. 23.55. Right time for some shut-eye. The events of the day weighed on my mind, and as I tried to drift off into the blissful embrace of sleep, I realized something was wrong. It was too quiet. Granted, it was late at night, but this was a different kind of silence. Normally what we think of as silence isn't true silence. It's our ears drowning out and ignoring all the background noise. But this was different. It was a total and complete silence. No soft droning of electronics in the background. No cricking of insects. It was as though time itself had stopped. Total, complete, silence. My gut wrenched. Then as though the previous silence was an illusion, in the distance I heard a faint thump. Thump, thump, thump. Was it getting closer? It sounded like someone was bouncing a ball down the hall. Thump. A sickening realization hit me. The thumping was right beside my bed. My heart seized and I clenched my eyes shut. Why hadn't I heard any footsteps? I slowly slid my hand underneath my pillow and tightly gripped my trusty K-bar. All right, whoever it is is going to have a very bad time. Grandma, can I play with him? The young boy's voice nearly disarmed me. What was a kid doing here? There aren't any living families on this base. Even if there were, how the hell did they get into my room? An elderly woman's voice called out to the boy. It sounded further away. From the doorway, perhaps? No, dear, the soldiers are tired, and they're al -seep already. You can play tomorrow. But Grandma this, one, is, still, awake. Two clammy hands grabbed my face with impossible force. I couldn't keep my eyes shut any longer. I opened my eyes and lashed out, or at least I tried to. In front of my eyes was a boy, two tiny hands still grabbing my face. His eyes, they're entirely black. The boy's face distorted into a maddened grin. And then he shrieked. Sir, are you all right? Wah, what, what, the, flying, F. I snapped my eyes open, only to see the worried face of Patty looming inches over mine. It's eight, sir. When you didn't turn up for PT, I figured something like this had happened. What? I glanced around. This isn't my room. 
How did I get into my office? By my side was a pool of dried blood, and as I checked myself for wounds, I found the source of it. Two small cuts on my wrist. What the F? Patty was staring at my desk, shaking her head and sighing. Wow, sir, this must be some kind of new record. Breaking four rules in your first 24 hours. Part two. So I messed up. In the span of 24 hours, I'd already broken four rules. What the F happened to me? It's all right, sir. You just missed the lights out timing. They don't disturb anyone who's asleep when they're making their rounds. Making their rounds? Patty, we're not talking about troopers on guard duty. What the hell is that kid? I need to know. I'm guessing you already have an idea, sir. Maybe you'd feel better after taking a warm shower and, you know, calm down for a bit. Meanwhile, I'll get Lieutenant Colonel Tom to talk to you, if that's what you want. I calmed my breathing and steeled my resolve. Please do. Patty was right. I mused as I dried myself off. A warm shower really does do you wonders. Putting on a clean set of clothes, I broke into a brisk jog to Tom's bunk. Good morning, sir. I almost instinctively mumbled a good morning before I caught myself. Glancing at the direction of that exceptionally cheery voice, I saw Emerson standing at attention, arm pulled tight into a smart salute. Mother F almost caught me off guard. What mighty fine weather we're having today, huh? Did you have fun last night, sir? He's still trying to goad me into a reply. Willing myself to drone out his voice, I broke into a full-on sprint until his voice trailed off behind me. Something is seriously wrong here. Tom was packing his things when I reached his room. Rough night? I wordlessly rolled up my sleeves and brought the scabs to his face. What do you think? I think you ignored the rules and now you're realizing the consequences. Look, I was against opening this role to outsiders in the first place. But that decision wasn't mine to make. If you aren't up to the task, I can write in to the chief and resort your posting. How the hell are you so calm about this? Why haven't you informed anyone, or even called a Mother F exorcist? He shot me a steely-eyed stare and muttered, Rule number 10, kiddo. What does that have to do with anything? And what the F is rule number 10 even? Look, kid, I've been in the force for 32 years, and I served all 32 of them in this base. Moving up the ranks slowly before I took command. I read your file. You're a scholar being groomed for success, short tours in multiple different units, along with the promotions that come with those posts. Hell, you're probably going to end up a general someday. He sighed before grabbing my shoulder. To ya, this will probably be a short tour as a CO before you get promoted and shifted to another location. But for me, it's different. For the people in this base, it's the only thing we've ever known read through all our files. Most of us have been in this base our entire careers. As the CO, you need to be the one fixing these situations. If you can't do that, don't. Let one of the guys take over. Go take a cushy role in HQ. Don't let these guys lose anyone else. Is that a tear welling up in his eye? I... I'm sorry. I guess some part of me still thought the rules were part of a hazing process. It was like he said. I didn't take the situation seriously, and I messed up big time. But I sure as hell wasn't going to let some ungodly creature stop me from doing my job. I'm not going to give up on this role just because some mother F brat made me piss myself. I'm going to do what I can to lead these men to the best of my capabilities. Well, what do you know? You got some backbone in you, kid. I respect that. But it's going to take more than pretty words to last here. You're going to need resolve, kid. Breaking some rules aren't just going to end with just scratches on your arm. Tom lifted his trouser legs, revealing a large gnarly scar that spanned the entirety of his right shin, from his ankles to his knees. What the F? Sometimes breaking the rules take a large chunk out of ya, and sometimes you got no choice but to break some rules. Pros and cons, kid. My conversation with Tom gave me glimpse of whatever twisted fate that awaited me, and yet for some reason, it didn't fill me with existential dread or the need to lubricate the insides of my thighs with piss. Nah, it just makes me want to do something about this place. As I strolled back to my office, Patty was waiting for me. So, are you leaving, sir? Did Lieutenant Colonel Tom make arrangements? No, Patty. I'm staying, and neither hell nor high water is going to stop me from accomplishing what I set out to do. Wow, sir. Color me impressed. Well, if you are going to stay, we are going to need to do something about the rules you broke. Right. The rules I've already broken. 
Well, Emerson's an annoying prick, so I won't be making that same mistake again. The only problem is what I'm going to do with the brat. About that, sir, I have an idea. My phone buzzed with a text from Patty. Sir, it's time now. Sure enough, my watch beeped to tell me it was now midnight. Patty's genius idea was to intentionally break rule number two and directly confront the entity that was the kid. Although I'm more worried about the grandmother. The cool sea breeze blowing in my direction sent chills down my spine. What am I even doing? Here I was, standing alone in the basketball court at midnight. Well, at least it's not the most dangerous thing I've done. Sure enough, I heard it. Thump. 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 The thumping of the ball hitting the ground. Stopped when it seemed to be inches behind me. Trying to calm my racing heart. I took in labored breaths. Do you wanna? Play. Stealing myself. I nodded. Hee hee. Catch. The whoosh of air told me the brat had thrown his ball toward me, and I instinctively turned to catch it. The ball was slick with some kind of fluid and surprisingly fuzzy. As I glanced around looking for the brat, it nearly slipped out of my hands. Wait. Something's wrong. The ball was way too hard and way too heavy. How the hell did he make the thumping sound with such a weird fuzzy ball? And that was when the sickening realization hit me. Praying that my gut was wrong, I held my breath and slowly looked down. In my hands was the brat's head. His mouth in an impossibly wide grin, eyes black as obsidian staring straight into mine. Where his neck should have been were bloody and jagged lumps of flesh. And then the brat spoke. Now run. Run before grandma catches you. Part 3. So things definitely weren't going according to plan. I'd deliberately broken rule number two as part of Patty's plan to get the brat to leave me alone. What I didn't realize was just how poorly thought out this whole thing had been. Here I was, standing in the middle of the basketball court at the stroke of midnight, holding the bloody severed head of an insidiously grinning black-eyed kid. Said head was also telling me to run. If you looked up the dictionary for the definition of a shitcho, I'm certain it would be this exact situation. Sighing, I recalled my conversation with Patty earlier that day. About that, sir, I have an idea. She shot me a mischievous grin. Typically, there's no problem with breaking rule number two. In fact, most of the cases I know about have ended after a simple game with the kid and his grandma. If you win, they leave you alone. On the other hand, if you lose, he'll keep coming back for you night after night to play with you again. I don't remember playing with him, though. Patty, I don't remember playing with the brat. I'm ashamed to admit, when I opened my eyes, I blacked out. Patty wagged her finger at me, looking like she was trying to stifle her laughter. In my defense, I... No need to explain yourself, sir. Well, since you blacked out, it means you forfeited the game. That's why that happened. And from now on, they'll be checking on you every night. Well, you can always sleep early, though. But on the days you can't, you'll have to be mentally prepared to play Tilda. I sighed. So what she's saying is that I just have to intentionally play that brat's game and win. So essentially you're telling me to play with a brat tonight. What kind of stupid game are we talking about? Catch. My words elicited a strange smile from Patty. She's awfully jovial about this whole situation. Not quite Tilda well, the game is sort of like hide and seek. Great. First off, when the kid throws you his ball, that'll signal the start of the game. Once the game starts, you'll have two win conditions. One, get from wherever you are to the boathouse and dump the ball into the sea via the window. You'll know which one when you get there. Or two, hide somewhere safe and evade the grandma until dawn. How the hell do you know so much about this? Toot it, sir. It's rude to pry. A woman's gotta have an air of mystery, after all. That just sounds like an awfully indirect way to say she's played their game before. Right. So I just need to dump the ball into the sea. That's it. Do I have to start the game in my room? By the boathouse window, sir. You can't just run onto the beach and throw the ball into the sea. That'll make them mad. And no. The game can start anywhere except in the boathouse. That'll rig the game in your favor. Right. So here are my options. Pulling out the map of the base, I pointed to the firing range. If I start here, the boathouse is about 400 meters to the northeast. At full sprint, I should make it within a minute then that'll be the end of it. I really wouldn't recommend that. There's too many trees and no cover. If shit hits the fan, there's no way for you to hide. Trust me, sir, there's absolutely no way you're going to outrun the grandma. That doesn't make sense at all. Well, if she says I can't outrun her, I'll just hide from her. 
What about the armory? I can grab the ball, lock myself up in the armory, and just sleep till morning. That will be more difficult than you think, sir. Honestly, I don't think it's possible to stay in one location with the ball, sir. Well, this is beginning to seem impossible. As I studied the map, the beginnings of plan began to form in my mind. I see. This could work. No wonder I wouldn't have been able to just hide with the ball. Run, run away. Grandma's coming. There seemed to be genuine frustration emanating from the brat's voice. For the first time, his mouth wasn't in a wide grin. His brows furrowed as he stared straight into my eyes and bellowed. Run. I snapped out of it and dashed to the left, towards the empty bunks reserved for visiting troops. Right? My objective is the boathouse. I'll have to assume the enemy has an unknown means of tracking the brat, so I can't dwell in one place too long. Ramming the door open with my left shoulder, the smell of blood filled my nostrils. It was as though the smell had permeated the entire building and clung to every single inch of it. My boot sank into the floor like it was a sponge, and the loud squelch stopped me dead in my tracks. What the F? I glanced at the floor. Blood was pooling around my boot, seeping into my socks. Hesitating, I looked back, only to see a white shadow heading straight for me. She was crawling towards me, all four limbs moving in tandem at such impossible speeds they looked like a blur. Her mouth was stretched far wider than was humanly possible. Inside were rows upon rows of glistening pointed teeth, specked with bits of red. Her eyes were locked onto me, or more specifically, what I was holding. I have. Perhaps my instincts of self-preservation took over. But I sprinted into the hallway, ignoring the splashes that accompanied each footfall. I ignored the nauseating smell of blood. I ignored the urge to look back. I ignored the laughter emanating from my hands. I just ran. Holy F. I'm not going to be able to outrun her. To the left, sir. What? Turn left now. I turned. It was an impossibly long hallway that in no way fitted in with the building's floor plan. Third door on the right, sir. I ignored the frenzied laughter coming from the monstrosity behind me and focused on the voice giving me directions. That always sounded just out of reach. The third door was so nondescript, I nearly missed it. It blended in with the walls so well, I wouldn't have known it was a door if not for the red glowing keyhole. There was no knob. Ah, what the hell. I rammed into it, not expecting it to fling open as I approached. Stumbling through the air, I hugged the brat's head close to my body. Bracing myself for impact, I didn't expect to land on sand. I turned, the building was now 400 meters behind me. I was now on the beach. Ha! Huh. A sudden sharp pain jolted me out of my confusion. I looked down. The brat bit me. You. Cheated. Grandma. Over. Here. I F. At his scream, a white figure leapt from the roof of the building and landed with a sickening splat. The scraping of nails against concrete killed any hope that the fall had somehow killed it, and she flew into a maddened crawl towards me, faster than she was in the beginning. The boathouse is to your right, sir, go. I ran. The boathouse was a hundred meters away. The maddened crackle of sand behind me told me that she was catching up. F. This was perhaps the fastest hundred meter dash of my entire life. Come here. Her shriek sounded like it came from directly behind me. F. I kicked the door to the boathouse open and leapt inside, just as a pair clammy hands grabbed my ankle. Her long black nails were digging into my skin and drawing blood, pulling me towards her with ferocious strength. Her mouth opened wider and wider as she pulled harder and harder. Her black eyes seemed to gleam with anticipation. She was cackling. I twisted my body and looked into the boathouse. At the far end of the room was a broken window with a trail of bloody handprints beneath it. You'll know which one when you're there. I really hope this is it. I lobbed the brat's head through the broken window. She let go. No. And she leapt after the head, disappearing through the window. Relief washed over me, and I let out a sigh. I am never going through this again. Well, 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 sir. Looks like you beat the game. And the owner of the voice stepped out of the shadows. Emerson looked at me and flashed his widest smile yet. I guess you owe me one now, don't you, sir? As soon as I turned 18, my parents demanded that I get a job. When three months passed and I was still unemployed, they went out and did it for me. I got hired at my family's park ranger business. 
We supplied places with park rangers who'd go out and protect the park for however long the rangers' owners could pay. I started in early winter. I was cold all the time. The job didn't start until about nine at night, or at least my shift didn't. I had to work until nine in the morning, 12 hours, five days a week. The pay was all right. It was my first day at a new park, a ski resort that had hired rangers to act as security. We weren't really qualified, but my family didn't have the greatest moral compass, so to speak. I started my shift, and I talked with a little guy at the front who said it was slow, not much happening. I was glad to hear this. Sitting inside and doing nothing for 12 hours, that's what I'd normally be doing anyway. I went inside and met the guy I'd be working with. We'll call him Freddy. He was reading the paper and drinking coffee. First day, he asked. Well, I never worked at this place before, but I've been working with Tony for quite a while. It's a good business. I trust him. He responded with a little chuckle and went back to sipping his coffee. Nothing happened for a couple of hours. We sat back, relaxed, talked about our lives, and even got into a funny conversation about my uncle. About three hours in, we heard a loud banging at the door. Freddy got up to open it, but there was nothing there, aside from a trail in the snow leading to the door. There wasn't much we could think about it. Maybe a bird or an animal, I don't know, Freddy said, getting back to his seat. I thought it was a bit weird for a bird to slam into the door fast enough to make a bang that loud and still somehow get back up and walk out of sight. I didn't say anything. I just shrugged. Whatever. After even more sitting and talking, Freddy got up and said he was going to use the bathroom. He jokingly asked if I could hold down the fort, then went outside. I leaned back in my chair, quietly singing a Billy Joel song that had been stuck in my head. Freddy basically kicked the door in, holding his hand. It was cut up and bleeding badly. I didn't think to ask questions. I shot up, ran to the first aid cabinet, grabbed the wrap, and put it around his arm. What happened out there? I asked him. He looked into my eyes and opened his mouth. Then there was another super loud bang on the door. I rushed to the door and locked it. I didn't know what was out there, but I did not feel like waiting for it to realize the door was open. Freddy was screaming in pain. I wrapped his wounds, but it wouldn't hold forever. I went over to the phone and called an ambulance. I explained that something attacked my co-worker. What? They asked. I don't know, I told them. They gave me a half-hearted, we'll send somebody, and I hung up. They asked me to stay on the line with them, but I didn't see how that would stop Freddy from bleeding out. Freddy slumped down, leaning against the table in the room. I slapped his face slightly to keep him awake. Freddy, who did this? He blinked his eyes and couldn't keep his head up anymore. He was out. His cut was worse than I thought, and the ambulance needed to come very quickly. As I put a blanket on him, another loud bang at the window made me jump. I looked back and saw a bloody hand on the window. It was a man, and he was begging to be let in. I ran over to the door and unlocked it. I went to the side where he was, but I didn't see him. Did he run around? I looked down and my jaw dropped. Right where he was standing was a trail of blood in the snow, going around the wall. I broke out of my shock, turning the corner, and there was the culprit. Not just one wolf, but I knew he wasn't the only one there. We both stood there looking at each other. He snarled, and I gulped. I knew the time it took me to get to the door was a lot less than it took him to get to me. I didn't want to risk it, just in case. I kept standing there. He took a step back. Maybe he's leaving, I thought to calm myself down but he did not leave. He took a step back and howled. Knowing what was coming, I ran to the door. He stopped and lunged, biting into the flesh of my leg. I screamed out in pain, but at least he wasn't calling his pack, or so I thought. He started to tear flesh, and I foolishly attempted to shake him off. He was on tight, ripping. I tried to push him off, but his teeth only sank in deeper. I put my right hand between my leg and the roof of his mouth, prying his teeth. I limped inside, slamming the door shut. I could hear these loud bone-popping noises and saw him now standing up on two legs, looking at me through the door. How I survived, I wasn't sure. I was bleeding out pretty bad, and the only gun I had was in my jeep outside. That's when I saw more of these things. They were upright, walking wolves, pacing around the place, moving back and forth, looking in the windows, waiting for one of us to come out. I sat there next to Freddy holding him, holding myself, trying to stay conscious. I was bleeding badly, and these things were out there. I counted at least three of them, the largest wolves I'd ever seen. What was going on? 
As things started to fade, I couldn't tell you what happened next, but the door burst open and several EMTs rushed in, attending to Freddy and me. They loaded me onto a stretcher, threw me in the ambulance, and the next thing I knew, I was being patched up. After this, I never heard from Freddy again. I was quickly removed from that location and reassigned to a different one altogether. I was told nothing, not allowed to ask questions, and even now, I live with the nightmare of those strange, violent wolves. Had I not made it back inside, I would have been torn to pieces. I was working the night shift when it happened. I patrolled all the little sections in the park for wildlife disturbance and vandalism in the dark. That's what most people with bad intentions come out to do. It was really quiet one night when my radio went off, saying that there had been reports of screaming over by B campsite, right near the forest. When I arrived, it had stopped, but the people there were still shaken up and they had reported this loud growling and guttural sounds coming out of the trees. Of course, when I got there, they were all standing around the fire, but nobody was talking or anything just before their screams, which had woken everybody up. People at Campsite B said they also saw somebody running across the road in front of them, only to disappear in the brush. This had occurred between Campsites A and C. They too stopped their car to investigate what was going on. It happened so quickly that nobody could really get a good look. People from Sida said something ran past them too and started screaming. They could not tell what it was, and none of these people knew each other, nor had they met before this trip. They were all just random folks spending a weekend at the park. So I followed the path that whatever had run across to see if I could find any tracks or anything. It was nearly impossible. All the ground was so hard and there were lots of people milling about. The campsite for B is near a bunch of dense woods within the park, so it wasn't too surprising something made its way over there. I checked out campsite since it was next and the closest to where the paths had crossed, but again, nothing turned up. The whole experience felt really strange. Everybody seemed genuinely freaked out outside their tents, but they wouldn't talk much at all. They just kept staring into the black trees with their flashlights, looking for something, waiting for something to come out of the darkness. It was definitely eerie and extremely quiet. I kept my radio on me, thinking we would hear something, but we never did. Although the time I was there, I did not hear anything out of the ordinary. That night, we went home a few hours before sunrise since most people were still awake. The next day, everybody at that campsite packed up pretty quickly, leaving as fast as they could. I guess I had heard from the overnight ranger that this campsite saw something that terrorized their tent. I haven't really heard much about it since then, but apparently, whatever they saw really spooked them. It's a darn shame. I hope whatever it is does not drive traffic away, and people do enjoy camping all year round, so hopefully, Whatever large animal this is goes away on its own. I'm hoping it's just maybe a moose or something, and that maybe these people just got spooked. It is the woods, after all, and people's nerves are a lot more on edge when they're out in the darkness or encountering things they don't quite understand. Hey, my name is Levy. I've never done this before, but people need to know what's out there. It's likely that you've heard of such monsters as skinwalkers, Wendigo, Bigfoot, but you choose to believe that creatures of that kind could never roam the earth, that humans are the top of the food chain, that we rule this planet. Though comforting, this mindset will not save you when you come face to face with a nightmare. When you realize how weak and helpless you truly are, it will be too late my long-distance girlfriend Tay, who is studying on the other side of the country, was visiting her parents in my town. It was my first time meeting them, and it went the way everyone wants it to go. I don't mean to brag, but they loved me, and they were really nice. When it got late and I was getting ready to go home, Tay's mom offered for me to stay while Tay was in town so that we could spend as much time as possible together until she has to go back to school. Tay looked at me excitedly 
and I asked, Are you sure? I don't want to be a burden, nonsense levy. Tay's mom says, We think you and Tay are perfect together, and we know how much she misses you when she's gone. Make the most of each other, Tay hugs her mom, and then pulls me and her dad into the hug. It was a beautiful moment, but I can't look at it now without it being tainted by the events that followed. The next few days were perfect. I spent more time with Tay than I ever had before. It was hard with her being so far away most of the time. FaceTime can only do so much to quench the emptiness I felt without her. But for these few days, life felt complete. I hung out with her family. We played card games for hours. I helped her dad fix his motorbike. Well, I say helped. I mostly just held the flashlight and handed him tools. But I think I won him over that day. He probably would have gave me his blessing in marriage if I had asked. That night we were all sat around the TV watching the new Lightyear movie, which was surprisingly good. I'd be lying if I said I didn't shed a few tears, around 11.18 p.m. when the movie finished. Tay's parents said goodnight and headed off to bed and a couple of Tay's friends who had been visiting said goodbye and drove home. I got up to get some water from the kitchen, and as I walked back I stood in the doorway that separated the kitchen from the living room, which was dark, only lit by the TV, allowing me to see Tay frozen, staring towards the window which was out of my direct line of sight. Confused, I peeked my head out of the doorway and looked toward the window. I froze and dropped my glass. Luckily it landed on the carpet and didn't make much of a noise, and the giant pale creature standing an inch from the window didn't notice. The creature was foul, a gaunt lanky humanoid. Well at least the head and torso was humanoid. It had no legs. The torso ended in a stump. The body was being held up by four arms, each one probably two meters long. The creature's whole body was covered in gray skin stretched tightly over its abnormally long bones. T. He thing had no hair anywhere. Its mouth was strangely wide, stretching around to where its ears would be if it had them. And its eyes were just sunken in kai black pits in its head. But I could tell it was just staring at Tay, who had tears rolling down her face. She slowly turned her head to look at me. She was shaking and breathing quickly. Levy. She whimpered, help. I had never felt so powerless. I'm a six foot two, lean but muscular 20 year old guy. I was supposed to protect her. I always thought I could, and I would die to protect her, but I had no idea how to protect her from whatever this thing was. Then I had an idea. I looked to the light switch panel to my left. I knew one of them was the porch light, but there were three others, the living room light, the kitchen light and the hall light. If I press the wrong light, I don't know what the thing will do, but I had to try. I had to remember. Which light did I see Tay's dad use to turn the porch light on when he went out last night? I reached for the light second from the bottom and flicked the switch. The hall light turned on. Luckily, the hall is on the opposite side of the kitchen to where the living room is, and it is out of view for the creature at the window. But I can't mess up again. If the kitchen light turns on, the creature will see me. And if the living room light turns on, it might cause it to attack Tay. I looked back to the creature, which was reaching using one of its hands to scratch the window. I had to do something. I reached for the bottom light switch and flicked it. The porch light turned on. The creature spun around to face it and let out a screech that will haunt my nightmares for the rest of my life. I ran to Tay and grabbed her dragging her off the side of the couch where there was about a meter gap between the armrest of the couch and the wall. And I held her. What else could I do? I can't fight the thing. We can't outrun it. Does Tay know how scared I am? Can she feel my heart running laps in my chest? I want her to feel safe, like nothing can hurt her when I'm there. But that's clearly not true. The sound of the window smashing fills the house and Tay cries into my shoulder. I hold her tightly. I kiss the top of her head and I wait quietly. I can't see anything. It's pitch darkness besides the slight blue glare from the TV on the wall above us. But I can hear raspy breathing and bones cracking as the thing searches the living room. I hear it sniffing the couch where Tay was sitting. And I hear it make its way closer to the end of the couch, one of its hands pressed on the wall above us. 
The closer it gets, the less scared I become. All that fear is replaced by anger. This thing wants to hurt the person I love with all of my heart. It wants to take the one thing that makes me happy. I would die for this girl, and I will die for this girl. I kiss her one more time and get myself into a defensive position so that I can easily tackle it before it reaches Tay. And as I see the silhouette of its head begin to peek over the side of the couch, suddenly the light turns on and Tay's dad yells as he sees us from the kitchen while he's holding a shotgun. The creature runs at him but falls to the ground as one of its arms is obliterated at the shoulder. After Tay's dad fires a shot, the creature shakes around on the ground like a fly without wings. Before it grabs the TV in one of its hands and flings it effortlessly at Tay's dad sending him flying into the kitchen counter behind him. The creature quickly sprints out of the window and unleashes a final screech as it disappears into the tree line behind the house. And here we are. I'm sitting at the hospital with Tay and her family. Her dad has a broken jaw, two of broken collarbones, six cracked ribs, two broken vertebrae in his back and a broken pelvis. He's sleeping right now due to the meds he's on, but he's supposed to recover, though he likely won't be able to walk for a while, if ever again. This whole thing happened around five hours ago. It's 4.38 a.m. as I'm writing this. The police left a while ago after telling us we can't go back to the house for a while. I don't know what that thing was, but it's safe to say we are not the dominant species in this world. There are things bigger than us, stronger than us, things you couldn't dream of. You think you can protect yourself, your family. The only difference between you and a rabbit being hunted by a wolf is that the rabbit knows that it's in danger and the rabbit is running for its life. I was laying down in the truck at a pilot truck stop about nine miles south of Eshtabula, Ohio on October 3, 2018 at 1 p.m. I always cover my windows to keep all lights out and lock all the doors. I had backed in, so the front of my truck was facing the storefront. Typically, I'm out by 11.30 p.m., but I kept getting a ringing sound in my right ear and was having trouble with my knee previous injury, unrelated. The last thing I remember is starting the truck around 12.30 a.m. to let the heat run. Then, it seemed almost instantly I was floating onto a table. The table felt high up, maybe five, six feet. I couldn't move anything. My head was turned to my right shoulder. It felt locked there. I was overwhelmed with fear and could feel myself attempting to cry out for help. Two very small 3.54 foot gray skinned creatures were to my right that I could see. Everyone describes gray aliens differently than these guys looked. Their entire body was stubby and their heads were almost too short for their eyes, which were very large like other people described. It was more over the shape of their face that looked different than typical photos you see. The photos you typically see show them elongated in the face. These two looked like it was almost smushed down and like they were squinting with wrinkles between the eyes. I couldn't speak or cry out, but I started to realize what was going on. So I thought in my head best way to describe it for them to please help me relax. I understood what was going on, but I could not calm down. Once I thought that, I could move my arms. So I reached out towards one with my right arm and it held my hand. I did the same with my left arm, and although I couldn't see it, something grabbed my left hand. Their hands were very soft but cold and felt kind of like a toddler's hand. Once I was holding with both my hands, I could not stop smiling. I was completely relaxed, and all I could feel was happiness. The one holding my hand on the right, I believe, is the one who was talking to me. It asked if I was sure that I wanted to remember this time, and I told it I was not sure. It was then that I realized that I'd been visited several times before. I believe the first time was when I was five. I recalled a small devil-like creature coming through the wall of my room. I had a bunk bed with no bottom bed, and it just floated straight up to my face. I immediately screamed. My dad came running in and found me in the far corner by my closet door. 
Being a kid, I told him the devil came for me. Now that I'm older, I realize it wasn't a devil. It was one of those creatures. The next incident wasn't until I was nine to ten years old. As I was going upstairs to bed, I stopped at the landing. Outside of the window, there was a saucer-shaped disc silver in color with a large orange dome on top of it. I thought that I had immediately gone downstairs to get my dad. But when I went to go get him to tell him what happened, he asked what I was doing still up. Apparently, I had been upstairs for almost an hour. I thought it was only a matter of seconds. After telling my dad what had happened, he grabbed our old VCR camcorder, went upstairs with me, and videotaped this craft which was still hovering outside the window. After about 10 to 15 seconds, it shot off and was gone. My dad went downstairs and called Airborne Express, which is the local DHL-type company that was in business at the time. He reported the incident to them as well as Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. No one reported seeing it. They said that nothing was showing up on radars around that time and that it was probably a coincidence. However, the next morning when we woke up, nothing was on the tape whatsoever. On top of that, we had a large pine tree outside of that window. It was lying on the ground and completely black on one side like it immediately burnt partially and then died. There was no other scaring to the ground. Back to the present. So I'm laying on the table and I can feel other hands around me on my legs, arms, ears, and then I feel a hard pressure around my genitals. Like a pump, but with pain like heat, pain. I am completely distracted while all this is going on though because the creature to my left is now alone. It's just me and him in my view. He's telling me all kinds of things about meeting me in the past, but I can't recall what he was saying. I do recall him saying that I would forget things if I wasn't ready, and unfortunately, he had no control over whether or not I would remember. He could only allow me to remember what I wanted to remember. About the time that I really calmed down and stopped feeling like I was going to have a heart attack, everyone was gone. I woke up in the truck laying on my back on top of my blankets. The truck was still running, but every light on the dash was lit up and alarms were going off on it. So I shut it off thinking it was overheating. I turned it back on a couple seconds later and everything was fine. The whole ordeal did not come to me until after I realized the truck was okay. I immediately started freaking out, and then I heard the same voice again telling me everything was okay and he would see me soon. I feel like over the years I have developed a friendship possibly with this creature, but I'm not sure of that. Honestly, I'm not really sure I even believe myself. However, I can tell you that those other two instances definitely did occur when I was younger, and I always wanted to know why they happened. I've always had an interest in aliens, but nothing more than any other young boy does. I've never fantasized about being abducted. I've honestly been freaked out about the thought of it, so I don't think that my mind is playing tricks on me or that I had a dream. Another note to add is I do not think that these creatures had a gender. The only reason why I say that is the voice in my head that was talking to me did not appear to be male or female. I did wake up with a slight nosebleed in my right nostril. I had a headache and continued to have a headache all day. I had very uncomfortable pressure internally. I do not drink alcohol. I do not do drugs. And to the best of my knowledge, I have no mental illness from either side of my family that is known. I have never been a sleepwalker, and I don't tend to have very many nightmares. I wish I could remember more of what happened. Although I would definitely be terrified if this occurs again, I hope that I can be more open to it when it does though. I know they will be back because I recall the creature saying it would see me again. The beginning of the encounter was very intrusive and it felt embarrassing. They seemed to just do what they needed to do and then they comforted me. I will say that I agree with others about the whole pure love feeling. I definitely felt as though it possibly genuinely cared about me. I'm not entirely sure that it did, but it was a very comforting feeling. One other thing I do recall it asking me was if I remembered them fixing me when I ruined my ability to reproduce. I didn't answer that I'm aware of, but I think I know what they were talking about. 
When I was on a deployment to Iraq, we would restart the radars standing in range of them. We were warned if we did that we could become sterile. So I used to do it every day joking that I did not need to have any more kids, as I had already had three at the time. I did wake up several nights with nosebleeds in Iraq, but in my opinion, I believe at least most of those were due to the desert air. I hope my story will help in some way, shape, or form. These are not all of the details of this event. I'm not very good at writing out things, and I only wanted to write out what I was sure of. I looked at the frayed end of my puppy's leash and sighed. The leash had been thrown in with the kennel I bought when I bought Picard, my Pomeranian. It had been old and ratty, but I figured it would work just as well as a new one. Apparently I was wrong. I'd only had Picard for two months, the leash was dead, and he was having a grand time somewhere in the woods behind my apartment complex. He was a good puppy, but also a hyperactive one and I was worried he would wear himself out and get lost. So I pushed through the undergrowth in the direction that he had scampered off. Picard, I called out. Come on, boy, it's going to be night time. You need to come get dinner. It had been half an hour, and I was starting to get a little bit worried and a little bit upset. I didn't know what I would do when I found the little guy, but at this point I was just hoping I would find him at all. The sun hadn't completely set but it would in less than an hour, and after I found Picard I would have to find my way back out of the woods. From the road or the apartments, the mass of trees looked quaint and contained, but from inside of it the forest seemed huge and imposing. Some of the trees had long scratches on them, usually a few feet above my head, or places a little lower where the bark had been torn off in ragged strips. All the branches up to about eight feet high had been broken off and piled around the bases of the trees, and I wondered who had done it and why. It must have taken days of effort for some landscaper to accomplish, and for what purpose? As far as I knew, no one came out here, not even the kids who lived in the apartments. Come to think of it, I hadn't even seen any animals in the woods since I moved in. I'd never noticed it. But now that the thought had entered my head, it was unsettling. Even if the forest was too small for deer, shouldn't there be squirrels or possums or something? I took another look at some of the scratches high on the trees. What were they? Most of them were groups of two parallel lines, gouged deep into the living wood of the trees. Bears had more than two claws, I knew that. Was it something done by whomever had broken off the low branches? I reached up to touch an overhanging branch. It was just out of reach. I was a tall guy, six feet even. Most people wouldn't be able to reach the branches. Maybe the manager of the apartments didn't want people climbing the trees. Picard, here puppy, let's go get a treat. I didn't want to be here anymore. I wanted to take my dog and go home. The sun was getting very low in the sky and I absolutely did not want to be in these woods after dark. There couldn't be anything to worry about. Nothing scarier than skunks lived in my state. But at this point I no longer cared. This place was wrong somehow and even the squirrels knew it. Picard, come, I heard dead leaves rustle behind me. I turned to look. Picard, good do. It wasn't Picard. The thing I saw was tall, eight feet at least. The branches overhead brushed its wolf-like ears. It was covered in thick fur, gray and mossy green, and it stood on two feet like a person. For a brief instant, I thought it must be a Bigfoot, but then I looked at its face, into its eyes, its four eyes. They were small and crimson, arranged in a band across its face where a human's nose would be. Its wide frog-like mouth split, and its entire head seemed to gape open to reveal hundreds thousands of teeth like knitting needles as a thick tongue like a twisted handkerchief thrust out and licked slowly across its lips. It took a horrible shuddering step towards me, and I took two back. It blinked, each eye from left to right taking a turn in sequence. Then it raised its long, long arm towards me. I felt my back hit against a tree and thought, 
Maybe I could climb up, wait for this thing to leave, for someone else to come, even though I knew no one would. But there were no branches in reach, and I suddenly realized why. I shouted at the thing to stop, but it ignored me. It took another step towards me, then a third, its paw outstretched with two thick curved claws extended. I closed my eyes. There was nothing I could do. Then I heard a low whine and a bark. Picard. Great. Not only was this thing going to eat me, but my little dog too. I opened my eyes and started to shout at Picard to run, but the thing was standing there covering its ears. Picard barked again, and the creature howled in what seemed like pain. Picard began barking incessantly, frantically, and the horror fled, running deeper into its terrible woods. Picard trotted over to me, his tail wagging, the other end of the leash still clipped to his collar. What a good boy, Picard. What a good boy. I hugged him close. We were both shaking as I tied the two ends of the leash together, and we ran home in the dark. Sometimes, from my window, I watched the woods. I never see animals, but sometimes there are new scratches, high on the trees. And when my neighbor complains about Picard barking in the night, I just smile and nod and apologize, and slip my dog an extra treat. I still remember the day I lost my friend, Mike. We were on a Navy SEAL mission in Wyoming tracking down a terrorist cell that had a hidden base in the mountains. We were hiking through the snow when we heard a loud explosion. We turned around and saw a huge fireball engulfing our chopper. It had been hit by a rocket launcher. We knew we had to get out of there fast before the enemy found us. We split up into two groups, Mike and I in one and the others in another. We agreed to meet at a rendezvous point where another chopper would pick us up. We ran as fast as we could, dodging bullets and grenades. We reached a cave where we decided to take cover for a while. We checked our radios, but they were jammed. We had no way of contacting the others. We waited for a few minutes, hoping that the coast was clear. Then we heard a roar, a loud, inhuman roar that made our blood run cold. We looked at each other and grabbed our guns. Something was coming. We saw a shadow moving in the darkness. It was big and fast. It leaped out of the cave and landed in front of us. It was a creature unlike anything we had ever seen. It had the body of a bear, but the head of a wolf. It had claws, fangs, and spikes all over its fur. It had red eyes that glowed with malice. It snarled at us and charged. We opened fire, but it seemed to have no effect. The bullets bounced off its skin as if it was wearing armor. It swiped at Mike and knocked him down. It bit his leg and dragged him into the cave. I screamed and followed them. I fired at the creature, but it ignored me. It reached the end of the cave where there was a metal door. It slammed the door shut and locked it. I heard Mike's muffled cries and the creature's growls. I banged on the door and shouted, Mike, Mike, hang on, buddy, I'm coming for you. I tried to break the door, but it was too strong. I looked around and saw a keypad. It had a code that I didn't know. I tried to guess it, but it was useless. I was running out of time. I gave up and slumped to the floor. I felt tears in my eyes and anger in my heart. I had failed my friend. I had failed my mission. I had failed my country. I don't know how long I stayed there until I heard a helicopter. It was our rescue team. They had found me and took me away. They asked me what happened, but I couldn't tell them. I was in shock. I was in denial. I was in grief. They took me to a hospital where they treated my wounds. They told me that the others had made it out alive, but they couldn't find Mike. They said he was missing in action, presumed dead. They said they would keep looking for him, but I knew they wouldn't. I knew he was gone. They gave me a medal and a discharge. They said I was a hero and a survivor. They said I should be proud and move on. 
They said they were sorry and left me alone. I didn't feel like a hero. I felt like a failure. I didn't want to move on. I wanted to go back. I didn't want their sympathy. I wanted their answers. What was that creature? Where did it come from? Why did it take Mike? What did it do to him? I needed to know. I needed to find out. I needed to avenge him. I spent the next few years searching for clues. I hacked into military databases and scoured the internet. I contacted former SEAL buddies and shady informants. I followed leads and chased rumors. I learned things that I wished I hadn't. I learned that the creature was part of a secret military program called Project Chimera. It was an experiment to create super soldiers by combining human and animal DNA and enhancing them with nanobots. Nanobots that could make them stronger, faster, and more lethal, but also more susceptible to hacking and remote control. I learned that Mike was not the only one who was taken by the creature. There were others who had gone missing in similar circumstances. They were all SEALs who had been on missions in remote areas. They were all captured and turned into chimeras. I learned that the program was run by a rogue general who had a twisted vision of the future. He wanted to create an army of chimeras that he could control with a device called the Master. He wanted to use them to overthrow the government and start a new world order. I learned that he had a base in the same mountain range where I had lost Mike. He had a lab where he performed his experiments. He had a vault where he stored his chimeras. He had a plan to unleash them on the world. I learned that he was about to execute his plan in a few days. He had a target, a small town in Wyoming, where he would test his chimeras. He had a date, New Year's Eve, when he would launch his attack. I learned that I had to stop him. I had to stop him before it was too late. I had to stop him for Mike. I gathered my gear and headed to Wyoming. I contacted some of my old SEAL buddies who agreed to help me. They were loyal and brave. They were the best and the only ones I could trust. We arrived at the town and set up our base. We scouted the area and located the enemy's base. We planned our strategy and prepared our weapons. We waited for the night and prayed for the best. We attacked at midnight when the fireworks started. We used the noise and the chaos to our advantage. We infiltrated the base and fought our way through. We reached the lab and planted the explosives. We reached the vault and opened the door. We saw them. The chimeras. There were dozens of them in cages. They were all different, but all the same. They were all monsters, but all human. They were all enemies, but all friends. We saw Mike. He was in a cage in the corner. He was different from the others. He was bigger and stronger. He was the alpha and the leader. He was the first and the last. He had changed beyond recognition. He looked like half Robocop, half human, with weird brain implants in his head. He snarled at us and broke his cage. He freed the other creatures and led them to us. They attacked us and showed no mercy. We fought back and gave it our all. We fired at them and tried to hit their weak spots. We aimed for the small electric circuit near their heads where their brain implants were. We knew it was the only way to kill them. We killed some of them, but not all of them. They were too many and too fast. In the end, we cleansed the base, but their leader escaped. We call for a backup and Chopper finally arrived. It led us to safety. While on Evac, some government official threatened us if we tell what happened to anyone. So I live in West Virginia and I was walking to a neighbor's house and as I was walking I look up at the mountains which are everywhere around her. And one of the mountains I focused on I seen a white orb looking thing. It was probably 100 feet above the ground. It was probably the size of an average garbage bag. I watched it float through the air for a good minute and I couldn't figure out what it was. 
Also, there was no wind at the time. All right, so just for context, me, my sister, and my mom were coming back from Indio, California from a stay at a hotel because it's pretty barren out there and it's creepy aff in the hotel because it's so quiet. Adding to that, we just didn't want her to be alone at the hotel because things happen. So yesterday night on Thursday, we drove back home. It was like an hour and 40 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. We get home, bring our small amount of luggage in, say hi to my dad and brother, relax and just prepare for bed. So skip maybe an hour or two. It was probably 12.30 a.m. or 1 a.m. Me, my brother, and my sister all share one room and we're already in bed. We're just on our phones doing our own thing. We have this little fan that doesn't make much noise, and we had opened the window for fresh air. After maybe 10 minutes or so, my brother says, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll be back. He gets up and leaves to do whatever he needs to do. Now it's just me and my sister in the room, and two minutes after my brother leaves, we hear this constant clinking sound. It wasn't inconsistent or anything, but we'd hear a clink, a two-second rest, and then another clink for what seemed to be a good 10 or 15 minute time span. So meanwhile, all this me and my sister wonder what it is. So she tells me to slowly close the window. I do that and we could still hear the clinking. And meanwhile, all of this me and my sister feel a sense of unease and heavy heartedness. My brother comes back, I tell him, and he turns off the fan and we just sit in bed quietly listening while he looks out the shutters. He asks me if we locked the door and I said I'm not sure so he goes downstairs. Chex comes back up and tells me to make sure to lock the top lock. We're sitting here listening and he looks out the window and claims something moved outside. Now keep in mind we leave maybe two or three minutes away from the San Gabriel Mountains so it could have just been a coyote or some kind of animal walking around because coyotes and other animals do often come down from the mountains for whatever reason. We fall asleep and the following morning my brother tells me that he could hear the clinking sound better and it sounded louder downstairs as it was down our driveway. Also this clinking sound sounded like some kind of wood hitting each we don't exactly have any sightings. We just heard something at night that seemed to make us uneasy. Anyone know what this could be? I've been threatened by law enforcement and political leaders in our area for my continued mention of the hairy people. We own a small plot of land in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, Calhoun County, West Virginia. We've got over 60 acres. It's been in my family for generations. I have a story to tell you about my brother and his friend that happened just three years ago. My brother didn't believe me about not crossing into the hairy people's valley. He is ex-military. They decided to hunt and camp right on the line where we don't cross. They camp too close to these monsters. Well, they found out the hard way that these beasts mean business. They woke up at three in the morning hearing their two large pit bull dogs being ripped to pieces. They came home crying for all of us to go with them and wipe out the whole family of these hairy beings. I explained to him that we've seen at least 30 of them going into the caves where they live. I know if we started a war with these hairy people we will lose. They can hide in these miles of caves then come out and come after whoever they want when they want. You will receive no help from the government or the cops. It's just an unwritten law for some reason. I don't know why, but I know it's true. Please share my story. People need to know that they are not only fighting these monsters, but for some reason we are fighting the very people who are supposed to keep us safe. I'm sure I'll be catching hell from our local law enforcement, but I'm beyond giving a damn. I'm ready to speak up and start talking about these dangerous hairy people. I like traveling alone. My RV camper is my home. I just love the look of the open road that's stretched endlessly as I maneuver my RV through the vast landscapes. 
I'm Sarah, a solo traveler seeking solace in the simplicity of the journey. Hours had passed since I last parked, and the exhaustion finally caught up with me. In need of rest, I decided to settle in a remote location, far from the hustle and bustle of civilization. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I parked my RV near remote wilderness. The quiet solitude was both calming and eerie. I prepared a simple meal, gazing out at the beauty surrounding me. That's when I noticed it a car parked nearby, inconspicuous at first. I shrugged off the initial unease, convincing myself it was another traveler seeking a quiet spot for the night. Night fell, and I crawled into my makeshift bed, the coziness of my RV providing a semblance of security. However, as the hours ticked away, an unsettling feeling crept over me. A subtle discomfort settled in my gut, and I couldn't shake the sensation of being watched. I dismissed it as paranoia, a byproduct of fatigue, and attempted to succumb to the embrace of sleep. In the dead of night, a strange noise jolted me awake. It was a sound foreign to the stillness, a whisper on the wind, a creak of metal. My heart pounded as I strained to listen, realizing the noise was just outside my RV. Panic seized me as I cautiously approached the window, peering into the darkness. A shadowy humanoid-like figure lurked, obscured by the night. Fear gripped me as I fumbled to secure the doors and windows, the figure persistently attempting entry. The vulnerability of my solitary existence sank in. I was alone, miles away from any semblance of help, and the eerie feeling of being hunted clawed at my senses. Desperation pushed me to reach for my phone, my lifeline to the outside world. But to my dismay, there was no signal. The isolation intensified, and my heart sank as I realized the gravity of the situation. My only hope was to turn on the RV and get the hell out of there. As I turned on my RV, the figure outside remained a menacing presence, refusing to relent. My attempts to scare it and threaten yield no results. After a few minutes, I went full throttle from that place and never again returned. If you're interested, I'll give you coordinates of the place of encounter. Some of you may remember that back in 2014, a man named Eric Frayne ambushed two Pennsylvania state troopers, killing one before fleeing into the woods, armed and intent to cause trouble, and beginning an almost 50-day manhunt in the wet forests of eastern Pennsylvania. That part of Pennsylvania is beautiful but treacherous land. It's rolling, gentle hills with thickets of scrub and hidden bogs. There are a million swamps to traverse, and some of those hills are secretly just piles of shale waiting to slide out from your feet. The tree cover is dense, and you cannot walk a straight line for 50 feet. Mr. Brain knew this land well, you see, and it's why he dodged a massive manhunt for about six weeks, often teasing the trackers and their dogs. He laid traps, stored weapon caches, and generally relived Rambo. First blood, but with way less fighting. I was working as a wetland scientist scouting out a proposed path for a natural gas pipeline through that land. In the middle of the manhunt, in the very same forest Mr. Brain hid in. So we were in the woods being stopped by search teams, buzzed by helicopters, and, in all likelihood, crossing old trails laid by Mr. Brain himself. When the pipe bomb traps hit the news, I spent every moment scanning the forest floor for tripwires. It was a frightening experience at odds with that land in early autumn. The bushes in the swamp started to turn fiery red while the leaves went orange and yellow. The air is crisp and there's enough green for it to stand out. Everything is covered in a light mist in the morning that burns off by lunchtime, and the sun is clear and warm. There is nothing so off-putting as standing in radiant beauty believing you are in absolute peril. When I was in my early 20s, my friends and I thought it would be a brilliant idea to go night hiking through some woods said to be haunted. It was a very, very, very old town that died out due to some illness, 
I believe the rumors said tuberculosis. You can walk the horse path, and there are stone foundations on either side of you. Really neat, actually. You were supposed to be able to hear children laughing and dancing in the trees, apparently. Yeah, didn't hear any children laughing, but I did record our whole hike. That night, going over the footage with a friend of mine on his TV, he told me to stop and rewind. I did, and we must have rewound that thing 30 times. There was a face peeking behind trees following us. Not a human face, a weird, gremlin-type face, distorted. Large sunken eyes and a flat nose, pointy chin. We thought we were seeing things, but we watched it so many times, adjusted the brightness and contrast on his TV. Sure as shit. Never went back. While on our honeymoon in June of 1985, my wife and I were backpacking overnight in the Mount Jefferson Wilderness area. We were camped about three miles from the trailhead. I think it was called the Whitewater Trailhead. We were camped just off the trail at around 5 e 300 feet, and there were no other campers around for miles. Sometime during the middle of the night, we were both awakened by very heavy footsteps coming down the trail. I was an experienced backpacker and had encountered deer, elk, and bear before including having my camp raided by a black bear in the Adirondack Mountains. This creature was definitely bipedal. It took two steps, stopped, took two more steps, stopped, etc. With each set of steps, the creature was clearly much closer to our camp. After the third or fourth set of steps, I let out the loudest scream I could muster. The creature immediately leapt took two steps away from camp and was gone. Its actions gave the impression that it was attempting to be stealthy and investigate our camp. After a few minutes we left the tent, we did not actually see the creature because the tent flap was zipped closed, built up the fire, and made lots of noise. Once there was sufficient light after several long hours, we examined the trail for footprints. The footsteps appeared to be coming from the trail, but as conditions had been dry, we found no prints. There were also no other signs of the creature around the area. As an experiment, my wife went into the tent, laid down, and I stomped down the trail as loudly as possible in my lug boots. I am six foot three and weighed around 220 at that time. She heard my stomping, but it was nothing compared to the night before where we could actually feel the ground shake. Also, despite my best efforts, I was unable to leave any prints on the trail. After thoroughly extinguishing the fire, we packed up and went back to our car. We did not report the incident to the Marion County Sheriff. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.